The past is everywhere. Vladimir Ilyich Lenin stares down from walls and looks over sidewalks. His body is still guarded, and since the Soviet Union is only 72 years old, Lenin's deeds are still remembered by many. But if the memories were ever pleasant, they are now obscured by anger. We can't buy things. When will the alcohol plant provide more vodka? Tell them to give us gasoline. Yuri Shekashikin stands at the intersection of the past and the future. He finds himself at a public meeting with people yelling at him. He is a politician by accident. The red flag in his lapel shows he is a newly elected people's deputy to the Soviet Congress, something like a congressman in the United States. Not even in a nightmare, my absolute worst nightmare, did it come to me that I would be a politician. <laughs> Chekhashikin writes for a national magazine and has criticized the establishment. As a result of his frank writings, a factory in the Ukraine chose him as a candidate to run for people's deputy. After a tough fight against the local political establishment, he was elected people's deputy for the city of Voroshilovgrad, a town of about a half million people. At least one weekend a month, he comes to Voroshilovgrad from his home in Moscow to hear from his constituents. They bring him their economic problems, their legal problems, even their plumbing problems. He and a staff of volunteers, his team as he calls them, try to provide answers. <laughs> the needs are immense. The most pressing is housing. Those who have it want it repaired. Those who don't have it are tired of waiting. Ever since Khrushchev, Soviet politicians have been promising apartments for everyone. Khrushchev actually began an ambitious public housing program, building thousands of five-story apartments. Those buildings were welcome then, but now they're sarcastically called Khrushchevi, which rhymes with Drushchevi, the Russian word for slum. The typical Soviet apartment is tiny, a cubicle for a bathtub, another for a toilet, a minuscule kitchen with a sink. A bedroom and living room, which in this case doubles as a greenhouse for potted vegetables. Seven people live here. At night, a couple sleeps in chairs in the living room. Outside, these apartment houses are falling apart, but their residents are fortunate. At least they have a place to call home. This woman and millions like her live in rooming houses waiting for apartments. She shares a room with her son, and a bathroom and kitchen with a hundred other people. She expects to live here for the rest of her life. In a way, these are some of the smallest obstacles the Soviet government faces. Buildings can be built, but memories can't be torn down. And Soviet citizens remember the crimes the government committed against them. In a clearing on the outskirts of town, Shekashikin and Father Boris Panov, a Russian Orthodox minister, confront those memories. Skulls bearing bullet holes, jaws, teeth, thigh bones. This is a newly discovered gravesite of some of the 20 million people murdered by Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin. It's a tragedy. Oh, it's a tragedy of the Russian land. Oh, the tears are coming. Well, evidently, just innocent people were massacred here. It's a pain. The priest and the politician are facing a part of history that some Soviets choose to ignore. For decades, party officials tried to hide this particular bit of history they built a garbage dump over the graves. But for many, the man who ordered the murders will never be forgotten. I always hated that tyrant. I, I knew that from the very beginning. Pietro Razumli is a Ukrainian. As dictator, Stalin squeezed the Ukraine into submission as part of the Soviet Union. Stalin also began concentration camps. Razumli spent three years of his life in two of them for speaking out against the government. His anger still boils. 
I never said a word about glorifying him or, so, or something of the kind. I always hated him. I think most of people all, always hated him. Nevertheless, they cried glory to Stalin. The symbols of the dictator's power still exist all over the nation. They conjure up waves of fear, and for many Soviets, knowledge about themselves they don't necessarily want to confront. We still have that fear, and uh, it's very difficult to get rid of uh, that. I, I, I think that it has become part of our genetic organization. As a boy of 11, uh, Vladimir Stankovich was told his Ukrainian uh, father had uh, been uh, taken by Stalin to a prison camp. Uh, his father died there. A decade later, Vladimir received a slip of paper from the government. It said his father, after his death, had been found innocent of crimes against the state. Now, when he discusses the period, Stankiewicz looks off into the distance, pondering the past, the present, and his country. It had a tremendous impact on the uh, the mentality of our people, on the moral makeup of society. I wouldn't say that uh, uh, we had no morals at that time. We had a peculiar kind of morals, you know. It was, uh, uh, we were taught that moral was what was good for the revolution. Shekashikin's constituents bring this historical baggage to his public meetings. Anger, guilt, self-doubt. They've never been able to talk to a public official before. Now, occasionally, they unleash decades worth of frustration on him. Most, though, are on his side. Shekashikin's election boosted the spirit for change. We knew him well from his articles, his publications, and there are not so many people like him, so that's why we supported him. He has gained more trust by answering their questions head on. Still, some are skeptical. One reason, he's a member of the Communist Party. To Westerners, that's a political distinction. But to many Soviets, it's a label of contempt. It's a country of two systems. Uh, it's a country for... Um, uh, there are different levels, country of different level. One level for uh, all citizens, the highest level for officials. Gennady Sakharov is one Ukrainian who wants to see the party dead. In fact, as a member of RUK, a Ukrainian separatist movement, he has taken his distaste for the party to the street. He and fellow RUK members want to see the Ukraine a separate nation unto itself, as it was before the Soviet Union existed. This viewpoint has never been popular with the Communist Party and Sakharov has lost his job because of his RUK membership. In the past, he and other Soviets never knew when a routine stop by a policeman could mean a permanent stay in jail courtesy of the party. The Soviet Union has not been the land of the fair trial. In the words of a Russian proverb, the law is a tiger and the prosecutor is a bear. Soviets refer to the judicial process as telephone justice. A phone call from a party official could determine the outcome of a case. Party privileges did not stop there. The party officials are separated, separated from us with the walls, I think, the Chinese wall of, uh, of uh, everyday life. They buy in different uh, shops their food, they uh, uh, go to different doctors, uh, they go to different houses of rest, etc., etc. Yuri Shekashikin receives no special privileges. As both a politician and a journalist, he has tried to change justice and party behavior. When I tell my constituents that your case should be treated in court, they say nothing is solved in court, nothing is settled there. They don't believe in the court system. I fight for the legal way of life in the Soviet Union. As it used to be, many court sentences were not determined in court, but in party committees. This is one of the main goals for us today. It is a Sunday morning in Voroshilovgrad. This is the proverbial smoke-filled room. 
Shekashikin is meeting with his team to discuss strategy on getting responsible candidates elected to city government. There is confidence and goodwill here. They know their work has brought positive change through the party. But some of them also expect a new communist party soon, one with as many as three factions. On the television, a show comes from Moscow, Shekashikin's home 500 miles away. It is a city changing so fast, he says, that it is different every time he returns home. The pace of history in Voroshilovgrad is more measured. Shekashikin tracks it by the methodical stream of complaints from his constituents. They've been conditioned not to trust him, but he spends tens of hours each week on better housing, a more responsive legal system, and on erasing the ghosts of the past. He is paid only for his expenses. He says there are hundreds of other new people's deputies just like him. Little by little, he says, the job will get done. The face of the struggle belongs to a woman. At a local grocery in Makevka in the Ukraine, it is mostly women who wait in line. At a supermarket in Leningrad, it is women who spend their Saturday waiting for food. We are accustomed to spend a lot of time in the lines, and we think that it's regular thing to stay in line. When you buy food in the Soviet Union, you often don't pay much money. This loaf of bread only costs 20 cents. Its real cost is the time it takes waiting in line to get it. A woman has to work a double working day in our country. She stays uh, in the office or at a factory for eight hours, and when she comes home, she has another working day facing her. In a high-rise hotel on the outskirts of Moscow, Tatyana Zaslavskaya studies at her desk. Perhaps better than anyone else in the Soviet Union, she knows what is happening in her country. She is head of the largest opinion polling firm in the nation. She's one of the most influential women in the Soviet Union, a people's deputy and one of the few women in the Supreme Soviet, a body which is somewhat comparable to the U.S. Senate. Her National Opinion Research Center is just two years old, one of the first of its kind here. Until recently, few people cared what citizens in the Soviet Union thought. Now, the political powers do care. Sociologists at the center have to work overtime to sort all the data they have to analyze. And people are clamoring to voice their opinions. A recent questionnaire in a national magazine asked that readers send their opinions on several issues to the research center. Bushels full of letters arrived. They fill a bathtub in this office, which is really a hotel room. Since there is little office space in Moscow, cramped hotel rooms have been pressed into service. There is a shortage of nearly everything here. That hurts the nation and its women. Now, what with the uh, total deficit in uh, our country at the present time, uh, I must say that uh, the lot of uh, the women in our country has become much more difficult because it's very difficult to get anything. Raising a family is a laborious balancing act weighing what you have against what you can get. If you find shoes, you might buy several pair, hoard them, swap them under the counter, or nyalevo, as they say in Russian, for items from here. This is a Beryoshka store where normal Soviets are not even permitted in the door. Only Westerners with foreign currency are allowed to shop in a Beryoshka. But in the sideways style of the Soviet economy, some of these items do find their way outside. If you're Heli Tix of Tallinn, Estonia, you can't depend on that. If you're looking for vegetables, you bundle up Helen in her snowsuit. You set off searching early and prepare for disappointment. This market specializes in vegetables, or avosti as the Russians call them. But the gay decorations on the wall do not match the merchandise. The main offering today is cabbage, unwashed carrots, barely recognizable beets, and dusty canned goods so poorly preserved their contents have turned gray. One bright spot this time is sugar. One must have a ration card to buy sugar here. 
That's an unexpected result of the national crackdown on alcoholism. Moscow cut the supply of vodka. People started using sugar to make their own booze at home. A sugar shortage ensued. That required rationing. At the next market, nothing is being rationed. There simply isn't much of anything left. It's late in the day, and the shelves have been picked clean. A few aged herring look for a customer. A haunch of meat, its best parts hacked away, sits on a counter. But there is bread for eight cents a loaf, and milk, items which are scarce in other parts of the Soviet Union. Helly, her husband Michael, and their three children live in a relatively large flat. It costs less than 40 rubles a month, one-sixth of the average Estonian salary. Oh, my poor little weapon is scared. The living room is fully equipped with electronic gear, a result of Michael's occasional travels abroad. The same travels brought a stock of imported food to the kitchen. Over dinner, it appears that fortune has smiled on the Tix family. They are young and healthy. Tunnel is enrolled in an advanced high school. Telly is in school as well. Michael's work publishing a literary magazine is going well. The Tix family is prosperous among Estonians. And Helly is fortunate that she does not have to work to help support the family. A woman uh, very often becomes the first v victim when it is necessary to cut down the stuff. She's the first to be fired. Uh, from all these viewpoints, a uh, woman uh, is on the losing side. Outside a Russian Orthodox cathedral, an old woman begs for money. She must live on a paltry retirement pension because she could not work much during her lifetime. Women like her often must exist on $10 a month. Per Perret does not sit outside a church. She speaks to us from the Intimus Women's Clinic in Tallinn, where she has had an abortion. Her melancholy eyes add years to her face. She is just 36 years old. As a single mother, she says she could not support more than the one child she already has. Abortion is the primary means for birth control in the Soviet Union. The average Soviet woman will receive eight abortions in her lifetime. One of the reasons, says clinic director Peter Pak, is the Soviet drug industry. It is incapable of manufacturing birth control pills and many of the other drugs the nation needs. The Soviet economy works backwards by Western standards. By some measures, it does not work at all. The industrial machine is driven by commands from above, not demand from below. Take the Lenin Industrial Complex in Voroshilovgrad in the Ukraine. It manufactures military ammunition, machine tools, chandeliers, children's toys, and oil field equipment. Until recently, the sense behind this kind of enterprise was not questioned by Soviet workers. They were more or less provided for. The state provided uh, quarters, apartment, uh, st uh, free uh, or very uh, inexpensive um, uh, nursery schools and kindergartens. Schooling, of course, is free. Higher education is free. Medical care is free. The quality is of very low level, but unless you know the the possibility for a higher level, you, you are not, you don't become very critical. Nick Popoff works for Tatyana Zaslavskaya in the National Center for Opinion Research. So what was happening over the last five years, first the awareness of the low quality of, weight, of many of those things, and then uh, simply a breaking apart of the system, which was accumulating all those problems, and they have reached the critical stage more or less all at once. Now, the Lenin plant in Voroshilovgrad has been commanded to help make a new product, disposable hypodermic syringes. The AIDS epidemic has spread in the Soviet Union because syringes have been reused without sterilization. Soviet industry does not have the capability to make disposable syringes. This plant has the job of making the machines to make the syringes. The goal, three billion syringes a year. The head of the complex says he does not know how much the machinery actually costs to manufacture, and he says he does not care. His goal is to make sure his nation gets the syringes it needs. This section of the plant used to make weapons. 
Managers and workers alike are happy that it now makes civilian products. But all is not well here. Manager Gennady Ozyurov says to make good products, his workers must be happy. And for that to happen, the economy must provide them what they need. Worker Igor Glot says no matter how much money he makes, the system cannot provide him a place to live. It makes him puzzled and mad at the same time. Why does it happen so that what is good for the whole world is surprisingly bad for us, like a market economy? which exists everywhere. I think that the government should take more radical measures to hurry up a little bit. The solution may lie in this cafe and this auto repair shop. They are cooperatives, privately owned enterprises which are allowed to make a profit. Quite Karistu heads them both. His businesses turn a profit, pay their workers top salaries, and have no trouble finding customers. He says he doesn't even have to advertise. But there are many obstacles to cooperatives. One of the biggest is public opinion. It's resentment of private property by some people and also, unfortunately, not unreadiness on the part of quite a substantial mass of people of the idea that some people may, through their own efforts, can earn much more than others. Back at the Intimus Women's Clinic, 20 abortions will be performed today. Money will be made in the process, for it too is a cooperative. The women who come here are willing to pay for abortions the state provides for free. Their reasons are fraught with the ironies of a society and an economy that is deeply askew. There is a very warm and cordial attitude towards patients, and there's no waiting line. For tens of thousands of visitors, this is the symbol of Moscow. St. Basil's Cathedral is more than 400 years old. It is the jewel of Red Square. <laughs> but for Soviets themselves, this is the place in Moscow really worth a visit. Truly revolutionary things are happening here. Clerks are courteous. Service is fast and efficient. The product is uniform and of high quality. Most amazing of all, the product is always available. This is the McDonald's in downtown Moscow. For Americans, an everyday thing. For Soviets, an economic miracle. Tatyana Lakova and her family just arrived in Moscow from Armenia. Their first stop is McDonald's. She even brought her own knife. Her joy can hardly be contained. We were in uh, we have, yes, we have visited another world. And uh, thank you very much to all the Americans that they uh, have helped us to some extent to solve the problem of public um, alimentation, public um, food. food yes. Kay Bilbro and her friends come here often. She says it's the wave of the future. Well, I think so, yes. I think this is the only way to go right now for us. On the outskirts of the city, Vladimir Shustakov thinks American-style capitalism is the only way to go as well. In the past two years, he says he has completely freed himself from what he calls Soviet thinking. Four times a week, he jogs through a birch forest near his apartment. No longer does he think of himself as a 64-year-old college professor. He is now a businessman, the head of the Soviet Business Center. The center is home to a number of cooperatives and joint ventures. Most have hopes of doing business with Western companies. But while the Soviet entrepreneurs may be raring to go, their system says not so fast. Well, uh, to put it uh, in a nutshell, we have to uh, bend over backwards, you know, in order to achieve our uh, aims. For his office space, Shostakov set his sights on this building, which is used mostly for children's recreation. He had to promise game machines for the children to acquire one room. To get a second, he had to arrange geography tutors for the kids. By the time a third room was arranged, Shostakov had signed a contract to provide a Danish teacher for some of the children. Americans would call this a nuisance. The Russian word for it is blot. 
swapping one favor for another. Soviet commerce is much like Soviet traffic. Notice the wide swerves on a straight road. One does not go directly from point A to point B. One drives around the potholes, which are large and numerous. Victor Rashitin put his cooperative on the road to capitalism two years ago. He was lucky to find an office in the basement of a building in his hometown of Dnepropetrovsk in the Ukraine. Then he had to find a way for his firm, Cooperative Reserve, to actually conduct business. Phones are scarce, and phone service is atrocious. For a business like Cooperative Reserve, which is trying to establish a database of Soviet cooperatives ready to do business with the West, communications are important. But it takes two days to place an overseas phone call, so the company must use cumbersome telex machines. Typewriters are relatively rare. Until recently, every one in the Soviet Union had to be registered with the government. And desktop computers may be the single most valuable commodity in the nation. This machine, which would have cost less than $1,500 in the United States, cost Cooperative Reserve $15,000. The doing of business is no less costly. Rashitin says taxes on foreign currency transactions can run 70%, and bribes, usually paid in goods rather than cash, are inescapable. How common are bribes in setting up businesses? Very common. Is that frustrating? <laughs> yes, it's very frustrating, but <clears throat> we have no other way. With dogged determination, Cooperative Reserve plunges ahead. The firm is a joint venture partner with an American company, and a new ad campaign is being readied for the United States. One already exists for the Soviet Union. This Cooperative Reserve commercial recently aired on Moscow TV. It advertises help for Soviet companies in making contacts with American firms. But if the customers line up and the money starts rolling in, there will still be a problem for Cooperative Reserve's American partner, getting its profits out of the country. Business opportunities abound in the Soviet Union, but the central problem is its currency, the ruble. It has no fixed exchange rate on the world market. Soviet officials refuse to give the money a hard value for fear that inflation will begin. On Moscow streets and on the most fashionable Russian tables, you will find Pepsi-Cola. That company has managed to do business here, but profits are taken indirectly. Pepsi takes its earnings in Russian vodka, which it then sells for profits. If the barriers are broken down, it will probably come from unlikely places such as this plain building in Moscow. The silver Mercedes is a clue that something unusual is already happening here. In the offices inside, a television blares rock videos on Moscow's version of MTV. The man in charge is 39-year-old Artyom Taratsov, by most accounts, the Soviet Union's first millionaire businessman. On his desk sits a small bottle of Gorbachev vodka, a brand now being sold in Germany, a reminder that perestroika can bring profits. For Taratsov, the first profits came by importing the computers now so much in demand here. Despite the need for the products in this nation hostile to entrepreneurs, it was a battle. When the profits came, Taratsov and his partners gave themselves each a salary equivalent to about a half million dollars. They wanted to make a point with the government, but the government struck back. The Minister of Finance voided all their contracts and froze their assets. In a historic move, Taratsov took it to court. And now we have a decision of this highest court that the uh, Minister of Finance was wrong. But uh, now we show that we are right. Taratsov made his point. In the room outside his office, people are lined up waiting to become capitalists. And he says high-ranking Soviet officials are quietly getting into private business on their own as well. Many chiefs, many uh, chiefs uh, and many even the members of our government try to make for them especially special places in the private, prepare these places. If something happens, they have these places. 
And now that's why they try to open joint venture and cooperative. According to Taratsov, at least one member of the Moscow City Council has made a special place for himself by becoming a partner in the new McDonald's. This seems to be the real hub of this city of 12 million people. 12,000 people applied for jobs here when it first opened. If rubles ever become convertible, it will be immensely profitable. A Big Mac, fries, and a Molochnia cocktail, a milkshake to us, cost about a half day's salary. 45,000 meals a day are now served here, making it the busiest restaurant in the world. The metal palm trees are almost a shrine. Here, Dad, I'll stand still while you take my picture. This is the place where the deals are fair. It is nighttime in the Ukraine. The moon has a fuzzy edge. Car headlights peer through a haze. And when morning comes, daylight reveals just what the haze is. Pollution. In a nation where industrial progress has been the ultimate goal for decades, Mother Russia grew at the expense of Mother Earth. Now all Soviets are becoming aware of how immense the destruction is. Water is polluted. Air is polluted. Well, the food, food is polluted, too. It contains a lot of, well, nitrates and a lot of, well, it's poisonous. Vladimir Solovyov is a college professor in the Ukraine. So I like doctors say, well, uh, your, your uh, health is endangered by smoking, so just give up smoking. If you are living in a city like Dnipropetrovsk or Varashilograd, well, well, I do not know, just, it doesn't matter. You, you will die all the same. And it doesn't matter whether you die of smoking cigarettes or of breathing, of jogging in the morning. Dnieper Petrovsk straddles the banks of the Dnieper River, a stream a lot like the American Mississippi. It is a city of a million and a half, until two years ago closed to Westerners because of the top secret missiles made in this factory. Now the veil of secrecy has been lifted, but the shroud of pollution remains. From the beginning, the Soviet tradition has been to build huge factories. To save money, they were rarely updated and never equipped with pollution controls. The Petrovsky steel plant in Yepper Petrovsk dates from the 1920s. Much of it appears to be simply worn out. But that doesn't prevent the factory from dumping thousands of tons of pollutants into the air every month. Party officials would not permit us to interview managers of the plant. But Valery Igrovich says Petrovsky has been a sore point for years. He sits in a cafe across the street from the factory. He is a journalist whose newspaper once criticized the operation. It's gotten much worse in the last few years. At this time, eight years ago, we raised this environmental question. We demanded that they remove people's living quarters from near the plant. The steel plant dumps its slag on the banks of the Dnieper. Although much of the waste is carried away while it's still steaming, much of it goes into the river. The stream is clear above the plant, dirty below. We demanded modern pollution control equipment. We demanded changes in the working place. But the situation has not changed. The situation has changed little anywhere in the Soviet Union. It sometimes seems that the Soviets set out to create their own industrial ecosystem with destruction as its goal. Near the Baltic Sea, the horizon is dotted with mountain ranges of pollution. In Estonia, rivers run red with chemicals, the final stain from an industry that damages the environment at every stage, from bottom to top. Near the city of Kotlyarva are some of the largest oil shale mines in existence. Hundreds of square miles of forest and farmland have been dug up so oil-bearing rock can be scooped from the ground. Part of the rock comes here to an industrial complex that covers more than three square miles. The focus of the facility is a series of kettles which are eight stories tall. They take raw oil shale and at more than 5,000 degrees literally cook petroleum out of it. 
The oil that results is used for fuel and chemicals. The cost of the process is tremendous because after mining and heating, only a small amount of energy actually results. But cost has rarely been an issue in Soviet industry. What is left over from the process is deadly. Half of the oil stays in the shale. The waste is piled in huge mountains next to the plant. To keep it from blowing, it's watered down. But as the water soaks through the mountain, it picks up a poisonous chemical called phenol. Lakes full of corrosive runoff ring the oil shale mountains, one of which actually caught on fire last summer. The water runs untouched to local streams, where it has virtually eliminated aquatic life. The phenol levels in these streams are 100 times higher than normal for the Soviet Union. This is where the administration building is. Environmentalist Otto in Doha looks over a map of the area. Every blotch is a strip mine, ruined forest, or polluted stream. I doubt if it would be possible to change anything in this area before the end of the century. The problem does not end with water. Most of the shale goes to power plants where it is used to make electricity. These are the largest oil shale electricity plants in the world. The people who built them are called patriots in the Soviet Union. But they create a huge amount of environmental damage. 120 million tons of dust go up the stacks here every year. The dust itself is dangerous to breathe. But the problem is made worse by sulfur gases which go up the stack with the dust. They turn into toxic sulfur dioxide. The chief environmental scientist of Estonia says respiratory disease here is more than twice the national average. There are twice as many premature births. And three times as many people are unable to work because of illness. Power plant manager Konstantin Shenchagov admits he has a problem, but says solutions will be difficult. How long will it be realistically before you solve the sulfur emissions problem? I consider that to reach the norm established by foreign countries, it would take 10 years probably. We are just in the initial stages in this question. The issue is basically economic. There is no money for pollution control equipment, and the nation needs the electricity the plants produce. All over the country, a hard choice is emerging. Economic survival versus public health. Production versus people. Johann Soot is on the people's side. He runs a plant too, but this one produces drinking water for the city of Tallinn, Estonia. Each year, the source, Lake Ulamista, becomes a little more polluted by the industries which line its shores. I am most worried for the children of the city, because the influence of this bad water on children is greater on them than on adults. It might cause polio or hepatitis. The biggest polluter is a 60-year-old paper plant. It is a collection of leaking pipes, rust-encrusted valves, and occupational perils. Logs are peeled, chipped, and turned into cellulose for paper production. The heart of the operation is the cellulose digester, which uses sulfuric acid to reduce the wood chips to a slurry. Signs warn workers of the extreme danger of breathing the air near the apparatus. A plant official almost runs as she shows us through the area. Four or five times a year, the machine malfunctions and dangerously high amounts of pollution go up the stack, into the air, and eventually the lake. At the Tallinn Health Department, the effects are well known. We've been trying to close the plant for 15 years. Dr. Natalie Leonard is chief of the Tallinn Health Department. There is evidence that the rate of sickness in the area of the cellulose factory is one and a half times higher than the rest of the city. Johann Soot's water treatment plant sits within a kilometer of the paper factory's stack. The main reason, he says, for the decline in the quality of Tallinn's water supply. What particularly galls residents is that the products made here are not even used in Estonia. They are exported to foreign countries for hard currency that the Soviet Union desperately needs, a case where a local population is suffering from the actions of Moscow. And so, as environmental scientist Mart Wilhelm sees it, pollution becomes an issue of independence. It will stop when Soviet power is stopped.
In a small house soon to be demolished as part of an urban renewal project, the environment and politics come together. Pete Susar of the Estonian Green Movement takes environmental complaints over a hotline. Susar shares his office with the Estonian Mothers Union, which is collecting protests over the way Estonian draftees are treated in the Soviet Army. Upstairs is the home of the newspaper of the Estonian People's Front, which triumphed in this spring's election. Each group complements the other in pushing for change in their country, but the environment is a constant reminder that change is needed. 800 miles away in Moscow, some people are listening. This man is a biologist by training. We would like to change and destroying of uh, the direction of destroying of nature. Nikolai Vorontsov is the chief of the Soviet Environmental Protection Agency, Goskom Peroda. As he stands in front of a map of his country, a nation spanning 11 time zones and covering one-sixth of the Earth, the immensity of his task becomes clear. He says he took this job because he felt responsible for his country. He is a new-style public servant in the Soviet Union. He does not even belong to the Communist Party. But he knows his toughest battles will be political, fought inside the Kremlin a few blocks away. The fight will be for money, one which his predecessor always lost. Baransov does not expect to reverse the decline in the Soviet environment before the end of the century. The cost of cleaning up industry will be too great. He balances this against the cost of not cleaning it up. Industrial pollution created losses of 40 billion rubles last year alone. Pure nature has a large cost. But uh, we must be understand then the bad nature and polluted nature have a more cost. Pragmatically, the Kremlin must realize polluted nature has a political cost. The small house in Tallinn may not look like the home of a political machine, but with the most polluted environment in the world as fuel, it might turn into one. Get an idea of how a nation laughs and you've got an idea of how it feels about itself. The most popular humor magazine in the Soviet Union is Crocodile. At its headquarters, cartoonists and writers are a kind of weather vane for the Soviet psyche. The fact that the magazine's namesake is a reptile with a fierce bite, but with a perpetual smile on its face, shows a cynicism typical of this nation. They don't smile much here, but editor Alexei Pyanov says they're laughing more than they used to. The laugh has changed. The laugh has become more open. Now we open our mouth wide. People laughing are not afraid of showing their teeth. They're not afraid that these teeth are going to be broken by someone. Pyanov and his colleagues recently came to the United States on an expedition to find out what is funny to Americans. They learned how Americans poke fun at George Bush. Still, for a magazine headquartered in the same building as Pravda, the historical Soviet propaganda arm, this is unfamiliar territory. I feel new possibilities open to us, yet within ourselves we still have that habit which suppresses our laugh. Writers have inflatable crocodiles over their desks and slogans on their walls, but these people are still figuring out what they're about. And even as the editor-in-chief, I still have to struggle with my own emotions which publicize and criticize and laugh at matters which were considered not long ago untouchable, sacred. Discerning the sacred from the unimportant, the habit from the ritual, can be difficult in this society. Some customs are perpetuated beyond the bounds of common sense. Take the ritual of the front door. In most Soviet buildings, one is not allowed to walk directly inside. No matter how many doors a building has, only the one on the far right opens. The rest are locked. Once beyond that barrier, only the far left-hand door will be unlocked. The message from the state to the citizen is relatively clear. We don't want you in this building. This has been a society of exclusion, where people build barriers between each other. The American notices that Russians don't seem to help each other. 
Is that true or not? On the street. You know, it's such and not such. Yes. <laughs> yes. Gennady Sakharov, the Ukrainian political activist. Because of conditions of life, uh, because of uh, that, what, uh, 72 years of slavery made with us a separated people of each other. And its uh, entities such, uh, really. Soviets are now scraping away the crust of self-protection they've built up over decades. Now, mm, people are at a loss, you know. We are in a state of great confusion. It is, I think, it's my personal view that we are now going through the uh, period of restoration, of uh, reviving the, or, uh, the, the old uh, moral values, the values which uh, humanity have to abide by and the values which must uh, constitute the true foundation of human existence. Vladimir Stankiewicz is a translator in Moscow. In his spare time, he writes philosophy. If you speak of the moral state of our society, it's uh, a state of, uh, uh, it's a very fragmentary state. There are different uh, scraps of old morals and new morals and changing morals. They're all mixed together. Whether for answers or from materialistic envy, Soviets are looking to the West, particularly to the United States. Sociologist Nick Popoff. Well, certainly the feeling has changed from a, an enemy image to a uh, friendly image. Even in the, in the worst times of our relationship, there's, there's been quite um, many areas of fascination with American uh, cultural life, uh, uh, you know, standard of living, fashion, different things for different people. At movie theaters, Rambo and Schwarzenegger movies are now playing. <laughs> Sylvester Stallone movies even make it onto TV. For many, religion is providing answers. Father Boris Panov struggled to keep his Russian Orthodox Church alive for years. Now he says his services are crowded. But this is a nation where atheism is the official state ideology. In Leningrad, St. Isaac's Cathedral was turned into a museum decades ago. And totalitarianism has scrubbed away the spiritual aspect of being Jewish. Jews are considered a nationality, not a religion. Many Jews spend their whole lives being persecuted for a religion they know nothing of. There is one synagogue in Moscow, sparsely attended. Many Soviets, labeled Jews by their society, don't really become Jews in a religious sense until they leave their country. I hate this country. I hate these people, but I just love this country and I love these people. Mary Terlova is a Jew, trapped by the absurdities of persecution. But the love-hate relationship she feels for her homeland is shared by many of her countrymen, regardless of background. I have the opportunity to immigrate because I'm Jewish. I cannot do it because I recognize that immigration right now is a sort of betraying of the country. Mary helps Western companies set up businesses in her country. And she's involved in Cafe Express, a cooperative bakery and cafe in Leningrad. The co-op is financially successful, but she's as proud of the values displayed here as the profits. She says the relationship of the employees shows the human side of the Soviet people. The main product is lavash, a kind of bread made in Soviet Georgia. The bakers are all refugees who've become as close as brothers. Roma came to the big city from the south, seeking his fortune. So did Misha. But his family was killed and his home destroyed in the Armenian earthquake two years ago. The co-op provides him with a place to live. Nikolai is an Azerbaijani who cannot return home because of the war with Armenia. The three have surmounted politics to become a kind of family. It is a similar warmth that gives Margaret Interot and her husband a place to sleep every night. They left Baku because of the fighting there seven months ago. 
For the past year, they've lived in the three-room apartment of her friend, Nazafa Tangarova. Nazafa took them in, she says, because they had no place else to go. For decades, Soviets have hidden their pain, confusion, and affection under a veneer of non-involvement. It defined the way they treated each other and their political activity. But that may be changing. I think there is much apathy. Nevertheless, every day we, we, uh, we uh, see that people become more politically engaged, more politically engaged. That's quite certain. For Pietro Razumli, political engagement has never been a problem. That's what put him in prison for three years. Now, at age 64, perestroika has brought fulfillment to his life. I feel myself the most happy man in the world now because I can speak, I can do whatever I want. Nobody tries to, to refuse me my right to speak, to, to do. That's my happiness. Rituals are part of life in the Soviet Union. Each Saturday in Leningrad, newly married couples make their way to the point of St. Basil's Island. They have their picture taken at the edge of the Neva River. And they go to the statue of Peter the Great, where they lay bouquets at his feet. On this Saturday, Sergei and Irene Secha brave cold and rain to place their carnations. Perhaps it is to honor the institution of marriage. Vladimir and Nagarita Vorobyev arrive with their entourage. Perhaps hope is their motivation. The divorce rate in the Soviet Union is high, almost as high as the United States. Sergei and Tatyana Kieva come too. Perhaps they're just afraid not to do something everyone else has done in the past. Each day at the tomb of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin on Red Square, bouquets of carnations appear on the granite wall. One does not see who puts them there. Is it a ritual of honor, hope, or fear? The answer is in the faces of perestroika. <laughs> 